Daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. China's GDP growth 5% in the first half of this year. Hamas has denied halting indirect ceasefire talks with Israel. The leader of Nepal's largest communist party has become the prime minister for the fourth time. Welcome to World Today, a news program with a different perspective. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching World Today. Official data show China's gross domestic product grew 5% in the first half of this year. China's GDP reached over 61 trillion yuan, or about 8.7 trillion U.S. dollars during the period. In the second quarter, the country's GDP expanded by 4.7%. Value-added industrial output, an important economic indicator, expanded 6% year-on-year in the first half of 2024. Fixed asset investment rose 3.9%, while retail sales of consumer goods went up 3.7%. The National Bureau of Statistics said the Chinese economy continued to improve in the first half in a stable manner thanks to support from policy incentives, rebound in external demand, and also development of new quality productive forces. For more, my colleague Zhao Yang spoke with Yao Shujie. He is Changkang Professor of Economics with Chongqing University. So, Professor Yao, thank you very much for joining us. In the first half of this year, China's GDP grew by 5% year on year. So how do you view this rise of 5% economic growth in China, especially under the current global economic background? Yeah, the, the 5% growth is fairly impressive in two respects. Firstly, I think given the internal and the external challenges, China is still, still able to achieve the 5% growth, which is quite uh, remarkable. Although 5% compared to the Chinese previous uh, performance, uh, which traditionally is higher uh, than 5% or even close to the two-digit level. But number one, China's economy is already fairly large. Last year, we had 126 trillion uh, RMB GDP. And another 5% growth is a remarkable uh, addition to the already fairly large size. And secondly, compared to the rest of the world, I mean, China is still uh, one of the best performing economy compared to the top 10 countries, uh, which is very uh, impressive. And certainly, I think because the annual target is 5%, so the first half of the year already achieved 5%, they give considerable confidence for the rest of the year for China to fulfill the entire year of economic growth target. Mm. China's foreign trade grew by 6.1% in the first half of this year. To what can we attribute this growth in trade? And how has the trade growth contributed to the momentum of China's economic development? This uh, growth is uh, particularly impressive because the external trade is continuing to outperform the domestic economic growth. It implies that external trade still contributes significantly to the domestic expansion of the economy. Particularly given the rest of the world, uh, China is already the largest exporter and the largest foreign traders, uh, you know, larger than the United States and any other countries. So China is able to continue to expand in uh, international trade is particularly impressive. Not only so, China seems to have gained a significant advantage in terms of export compared to import. That generates a significant surplus, which is a useful addition to the domestic economy. Mm. And exports rose by 6.9%, while imports climbed 5.2%. So what are the highlights of China's imports and exports, do you think? Yeah, in terms of the export, as I mentioned, it's already much bigger than the import. They generate a, a historical high trade surplus. And in, in export, I think China's export is mainly driving by the high-end, high-quality uh, product in terms of, uh, let's say, new energy vehicles, computer chips, and also lithium uh, battery and, and so on. 
So China doesn't actually rely on traditional agriculture and raw material export. It rely on high-end manufacturing uh, industrial product. In terms of import, you can see import is used to complement the domestic deficit in a number of key areas. For example, like agricultural goods, like oils and other raw materials, and also the expanding uh, you know, AI sector in terms of computer chips and so on and so forth. So these kinds of complementarity is driving the domestic uh, economy to become even more conducive for the consumer demands. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if China continue the trend of import and export in the rest of the year, it will be very useful for the country to achieve the 5% economic growth target. Mm. And the latest data shows that the economy continues to recover with stable production, demand, employment, and prices, as well as the strong exports. So could you elaborate more on that? For example, what about industrial output and consumer spending recovery so far this year? And the investment in high-end manufacturing sector also jumped even over 10%. So what does this tell us? Yes, the 5% growth is an aggregate indication, indication of the, uh, the health of the Chinese economy. But it also indicates the improvement of the quality of the national economy. For example, like investment, consumption, and also uh, manufacturing, they are moving toward the higher end of the international markets. Uh, the, the investment in particular, this year, the first year is 3.9%. And for the high-tech industries and innovation industries, it's over two digits. That means China is investing in the future to upgrade the industrial uh, system. And this will give a stronger foundation for the transformation of the industrial system in China. Mm. Now, in, in terms of consumption, I think, uh, and, and also the manufacturing sector, it, it provides a fairly good signal that China is overall making a steady and, and, and comprehensive balanced growth in different aspects of the national economy in terms of uh, investment, consumption, uh, you know, industrial output services, and ag even the agricultural sector is still seeing a, a significant expansion uh, records. Mm. And the government have already put into place a series of measures to stimulate the market demand, including the issuance of one trillion yuan ultra long treasury bonds and the large scale you know, equipment renewal and trade-ins of uh, consumer goods. So how do all these measures help the economy? Yes, consumption is certainly a, a significant stimulation for the economy expansion. And the government policy to increase the, the, the long term debt, the long term bond, uh, one trillion bond is part of the effort. And also the trading in uh, industrial goods for the trading uh, for the new product, uh, you know, to replace the older one is another effort. Now, um, the most important government policy is to make sure there is a steady employment opportunity uh, for the people. For especially for the new graduate. If more employment are created, people uh, have more steady income, they will be able to consume more. So there they is, they is a multiple factors mm -hmm. that the government have to consider at the same time in terms of stimulating domestic consumption. Mm. And Professor Yao, actually, new quality productive forces has been emphasized for China's economy. So what effects might this strategy have on China's economic performance? Yes, I think you, you need a little bit historical background. China, up to 40 years of rapid economic expansion, per capita GDP is already reaching a, a level very close to the high income country defined by the World Bank and continue to uh, increase per capita income, particularly the labor productivity. I think China to rely more and more on technological innovation and investment in the innovation sector, high-tech sector. All these are important factors determining the so-called high productive forces. Mm -hmm. So high, high productive forces is going to boost the quality of the labor, 
boost the quality of what we use in the production system and also to boost the quality of the final product, which mm. are going to be fairly welcomed by the domestic consumer, but also have a very strong competitive advantage in the world market. Mm. And how do you see the development of the new industries like artificial intelligence, computer chips and quantum computing in China? Well, you can see everyday news, particularly the, the you know, the local taxi driver, uh, the taxi in Wuhan and also spread into 15 other uh, metropolitan city in, in, in China. These are the, the AI driven technology is going to have a fairly profound challenges in the labor market and also in the production system, uh, the service system as well. And also the low, uh, you know, sky flying activity, quantum computers, and also the technological progress in the chip making sector. All these are every indicator that China is moving toward the world frontier of technology and is directly challenging uh, with the most advanced economy and international corporations. Mm. So you will see in the future decades, not only one decade, but decades, China will continue to be a major player in the international arena in terms of innovation and technological advances. Mm. And international organizations and the market analysts now they have raised their forecast for China's economic growth. So help us understand that. And will there be more FDI or foreign direct investment coming to China? Where are the opportunities and what's the outlook for China's economy? Yeah, the, the welcome international investment to the domestic market is the continue and determination uh, policy of the central and local government. I think uh, international organizations have looked at China in a more favorable conditions, raising the economy forecast to about 5% like uh, the government have uh, you know, targeted. This is a very good uh, signal for multinational company to uh, come to China. China not only uh, have a huge market for foreign investors, but also China have been uh, perfectioning uh, the, the law and regulation to make sure the foreign investor in China can enjoy the, the, the benefit that the big market can provide to them. That was Yao Shujie, Chang Kang Professor of Economics with Chongqing University. Coming up, Hamas said peace talk discussion with Israel haven't been stopped. This is World Today. We'll be right back. Hello, I am Dr. Digby James Wren, a political analyst and international relations scholar specializing in China area studies. World Today offers unmatched in-depth perspectives on China's politics, economics, business, technology and society. World Today's team of reporters and contributors provides valuable information from all of the world's major economies. I hope you can join me on World Today for the very best insights and news from China, on China and help to build a better understanding of China's role in the world today. Welcome back to the show. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. Hamas has denied halting indirect ceasefire talks with Israel following Israel's attack on Khan Yunus in southern Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed that the war will end only all their goals are met. Sarah Coates reports from Tel Aviv. These talks once again appear to be hanging in the balance in the wake of this assassination attempt on Mohammed Dayef, a very senior Hamas commander. Now, we've also heard from the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He held a press conference. He said that he's not absolutely certain that Dayef was killed in Saturday's strike, but he did go on to say it's generated pressure on Hamas to soften its stance when it comes to negotiations. Now, we do understand that Benjamin Netanyahu will be holding a fairly high-level meeting with senior officials right here in Tel Aviv amid a lot of pressure from these family members and loved ones of these 120 or so Israeli hostages that do remain in the Gaza Strip. There were a number of demonstrations held right across the country over the weekend with the Hostage and Missing Families Forum putting out a statement saying that by the time everyone comes to their senses and works together, 
there may be no one to bring back. And we do have a bit of a, a breaking news line for you amid this international pressure also for Israel and Hamas to come to a deal. And that is that Benjamin Netanyahu will meet President Biden at the White House on July 22nd, just two days ahead of that congressional address. That was Sarah Coase reporting from Tel Aviv. For more, we're joined by Dr. Guy Burton. He is adjunct professor at the Department of International Affairs, Vassalis College in Brussels. Dr. Burton, thanks for talking to us again. How do you comment on the general condition of the war in Gaza at the moment? Well, it's ongoing. I mean, what we've seen is uh, we've got to a point now where the Israelis are effectively trying to uh, root out um, Hamas from across the territory. Uh, I mean, they did it back in the north at the start of the campaign, and then they worked their way down to Rafa, and they now seem to be back in the center of the of, of the enclave in Gaza City. Um, and, you know, from what we were told, that the, the intention of the Israelis at the outset was to completely eliminate Hamas. And it seems that that hasn't happened because, yes, Hamas has been you know, damaged, but uh, it's still managing to put soldiers into the field. Mm. Well, uh, Hamas has just uh, rejected the idea that mediated ceasefire discussions had been suspended. Now, first of all, why was the previous three-stage ceasefire proposal, which was already um, passed by the United Nations, why was that stalled in the first place? Well, I think it really comes down to the to the antagonists themselves. I mean, when you think about it, at the end of the day, what is going to happen if the cease, if if a permanent ceasefire and eventual sort of reconstruction of Gaza happens uh, for for Hamas? I mean, the 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 understanding, at least from the international community in Israel, is that Hamas will have no part to play in this, and and that seems a bit odd for Hamas, you know, to be involved in that process, to, to be involved in talks which are. Uh, afterwards they would then leave the scene it's very hard to see that happening and as for the israelis as well i mean domestically there are political uh, motivations for netanyahu to keep this the fighting going on he has problems at home um with you know sort of um, you know court cases against him also the the far right that is in his government wanting to keep the the, the fighting ongoing so you know there's there's reasons as as much to keep the fighting going on by both antagonists as there is to, to end it mm. Well, um, as regard to the current negotiations, in your understanding, what might be some of the sticking points? Well, you know, because it seems to be the sequenced, right? So the Mm. idea of these, these, these negotiations and an eventual ceasefire was that in exchange for uh, you know, stopping the fighting, that uh, the hostages would be released uh, for, to Israel and uh, aid would be able to, to be let in. But there does seem to be a difference of opinion between Israel and Hamas as to what should come first. Um, you know, Hamas just wants to see fighting ended, uh, whereas Israel wants to see uh, you know, the, the hostages uh, brought back. So, you know, I mean, maybe these things can be finessed somewhat, but I think, you know, they are still, you know, quite quite wide apart and that's why the the role of the mediators is so important to try and sort of try and bring the at least try and find the points of overlap that they can that they can do with this but i also come back to the point that i made earlier which is that after the you know with the uh, eventually with a permanent ceasefire taking place i mean further down the track you know the expectations would be that israel would withdraw from gaza Mm. uh, and reconstruction would begin now israel under the netanyahu government shows no inclination at all to uh you know to to leave the field in gaza and and it's very hard as i said to see hamas uh, willing to uh, sign it's effectively its own death warrant and not be involved in any kind of uh, post-war war war gaza Mm. In your understanding, how are the negotiations and the fighting on the ground related to each other? Well, this is it, because the, you know, the, the Israelis want to continue the fighting, really to try and weaken Hamas and force it to the table. Um, you know, right now, the fact that Hamas is able to still put soldiers into the field undermines the Israeli uh, initial uh, war objective of the Israelis, which was to smash Hamas. Mm. Um, in effect, what Hamas has to do is just keep standing, just to keep still maintaining a presence, a little bit like Hezbollah did against Israel back in 2006. You know, back then, the Israelis were unable to uh, completely eliminate Hezbollah. And, they, and so the simple fact that Hezbollah remained at the end of the, the fighting meant it was a kind of a, a, a ferric vi- victory for them. And I think the same can probably be said for Hamas as well. Um, but as I said, you know, Israel wants to try and weaken Hamas as much as possible to try and make it make uh, make 
their ability to uh, to, to reach a, an agreement uh, much weaker. And, and that's why partly you've been seeing some of these attacks recently that have been targeted against Hamas commanders and hence the, the big massacre that we saw in Gaza City this, this weekend. Mm. Well, in a recent visit to Gaza, the new British Foreign Secretary David Lammy called for an immediate ceasefire. So he's uh, the latest uh, government official from uh, major Western countries to visit the region. What role is the British government playing in the mediations, if there's any? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the point to make. I think, mm. you know, the British are supportive of international efforts and the, and the principal mediators who are Egypt and Qatar and all of this. But really, the British have very little uh, to, to offer in terms of actual uh, substance to, to the negotiations. I mean, that yes, they are a power, as you've pointed out, and they do have a presence at the, you know, in, the, in the UN Security Council. And obviously, they have been um, noting, I mean, they've not done it yet, but they have indicated that there is maybe further down the track, Britain would be prepared to accept uh, the principle of the idea of, of Palestine as an independent state. Um, that hasn't followed through yet. But honestly, I don't think it's, we're going to really see the British as the key uh, instigators of any uh, you know, ceasefire agreement. Yes, you're right. Um, Lamy's going to be in Israel. He's going to be talking to Netanyahu. He's going to be pushing for you know, more aid and, 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 for, and for a ceasefire. But really, the British, I don't think, have much to, to, to offer uh, in, in a substantive way. Mm. The Associated Press reported that on Sunday, Israeli strike in central Gaza killed at least 14 people at the gate of a school used as a shelter for displaced people. I mean, is there any pressure either domestic or international at the moment to limit Israeli armies targeting areas? I mean, it doesn't look like it, right? I mean, the fact that this continues, you know, indicates that uh, whatever pressure there is, uh, whether overt or, or, you know, discreet, is, is not really having its effect. I mean, you might imagine that, you know, if the, um, you know, the IC, uh, you know, the ICC's process of, of uh, you know, prosecuting Netanyahu and others for war crimes, if that it does, does start to sort of snowball, then you might maybe start seeing Israeli commanders, uh, you know, sort of issuing instructions and regulations to their to their soldiers to you know to, to put a lid on it mm-hmm. um you know because but i right now it's very hard to see you know any kind of uh, pressure being put on the israelis if at all mm. well then are major western powers like the united states still acting on mediation efforts or are they distracted by other affairs Oh, I think you've answered your question there. Mm. I think, you know, the yes, the Ameri- I mean, in terms of the Western powers, obviously, the Americans are the most important one there. And certainly, you know, the Biden administration has been quite key in putting forward, you know, sort of this three stage uh, ceasefire proposal and framework. But uh, you know, honestly, the, the Americans are limited in their leverage. I mean, yes, President Biden is popular with the Israeli society, but how much influence he actually has over the Netanyahu government has pretty much been lost. Um, because the Americans from the outset, after October the 7th, aligned themselves so closely to Israel, it makes them rather weak when it comes to pushing the Israelis to, uh, you know, to, 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 to to, to reach an agreement with Hamas on this. I mean, I suppose you could say that at least they're in the room in a way that the British aren't. But really, we're about to enter into the election season, which I think makes means it's somewhat unlikely that there's going to be a lot of American uh, attention to what's going on in the Middle East over the next few months, certainly mm-hmm. until the election, I would imagine. Thank you. That was Dr. Guy Burton, adjunct professor at the Department of International Affairs of Vassalis College in Brussels. Coming up, former Nepalese Prime Minister Khadgar Prasad Ali has become the country's Prime Minister for the fourth time. For more discussions, you can follow us on the X platform at CGTN Radio. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing, and this is World Today. We'll be right back after a short break. Elaf Elard, economics professor and member of the Data Science and AI Center at New York University, Shanghai. On the World Today program, 
you can find in-depth and impartial insight, as well as critical commentary on key trends in the Chinese economy, financial technology, business, and blockchain. To prepare for the world tomorrow, join me on World Today. Welcome back to the show. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. The leader of Nepal's largest communist party has become the prime minister for the fourth time. Khadga Prasad Ali takes off office on Monday and must seek a vote of confidence in parliament to continue in office within a month. The change of power follows the stepping down of Pushpa Kamal Dahal of a previous coalition government. Ali's party, which was part of the coalition, withdrew to form a new government with a center-left Nepalese Congress party. First elected as prime minister in 2015, Ali was re-elected in 2018 and reappointed briefly in 2021. For more, my colleague Zhao Ying joins us in the studio. Thank you, Zhao Ying. Now, first up, give us a brief uh, review of uh, the recent political changes in Nepal. What has led to the stepping down of a Pushpa Kamal Dahal's go- uh, coalition government? Yes, um, actually, the recent political changes in Nepal are a continuation of the country's ongoing struggle with uh, with its political instability. Pushpa Kamal Dahal, also known as Perchenda, who was the prime minister, lost a confidence vote in parliament on Friday. And uh, this vote was precipitated by a shift in alliances within the coalition government. Perchenda is uh, the chairman of the Communist Party of Nepal Maoist Center, and his tenure was marked by frequent changes in coalition partners. His government collapsed when his uh, when his coalition partners, including the CPN UML, the Unified Marxist Leninist, led by K. P. Sharma Ali, withdrew their support. Um, and K. P. Sharma Ali, who was previously served as prime minister three times, managed to form a new coalition with the Nepali Congress which is the largest party in parliament. And under the new power-sharing agreement, Ali and the president of the Nepali Congress, Sher Bahadur Duba, will alternate as prime minister until the next general election in 2027. So uh, this constant shifting of alliances uh, and the frequent changes in leadership actually reflect the deep-seated political fragmentation in Nepal. Perchenda's government, which was in power since late 2022, faced criticism for its inability to maintain a stable coalition and for allegations of prioritizing personal and party benefits over national interests. And this instability has hampered governance and development efforts in Nepal, um, a country that has faced significant challenges, including natural disasters and economic hardships. So the collapse of Perchenda's government can be seen as part of a larger pattern of political uh, you know, instability that has plagued Nepal since it became a federal demo- democratic republic in 2008. Mm. What factors have contributed to these frequent political changes in the country? Well, there are both um, historical and contemporary issues. Uh, first of all, the transition from a centuries-old Hindu monarchy to a federal democratic republic in 2008 was indeed a significant upheaval, and this shift was intended to bring stability and development to the country, but it also created a complex and often contentious political landscape. And one major factor is the fragmented nature of Nepalese politics. The country has many political parties, each with varying ideologies and regional bases, and this fragmentation makes it difficult to form a stable coalition, and this leads to frequent changes in governments um, and also uh, these um, shift in, in alliances. So this recent political drama, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, was triggered by the Nap- uh, uh, Nepali Congress, uh, the NC and the CPN UML, coming together to oust uh, Prime Minister uh, Perchenda. And another contributing factor is the legacy of the Maoist insurgency, which lasted from 1996 to 2006. Uh, The insurgency and subsequent peace process brought former rebels into political mainstream, 
but it also left a legacy of mistrust and competition among political leaders. So Prachanda, who is who was a central figure in this insurgency, has been a key player in Nepal's politics since laying down arms. But his frequent shifts in 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 alliances highlighted this ongoing instability. And additionally, Nepal's political system itself has some structural issues. Um, for instance, the constitution of uh, 2015, while it is a significant step towards stability, it has provisions that sometimes complicate governance, um, like the requirements for coalition governments, the proportional representation system, and the federal st- structure all contribute to a scenario where no single party can easily maintain power. And also, we need to consider Nepal's geopolitical position between two major powers, India and China. So the foreign relations can also sometimes exacerbate those internal divisions. Mm. Now, uh, what about Ali himself? Uh, can you tell us more about him and his political background? Uh, yes, um, KP Sharma Ali is a prominent figure in Nepalese politics with a long and varied career. He was born in 1952 and he entered politics as a teenager and quickly became involved in the communist movement which opposed the monarchy. Ali's political journey began with his involvement in the Nepal Communist Party in the late 1960s, and his activism led to multiple arrests, and he actually spent 14 years in prison for campaigning against the autocratic Pachayant system and the monarchy. So after his release, he continued to rise through the ranks of the communist movement, and he joined the CPN-UML in 1987 and became a key leader within the party. His first significant political breakthrough came in 1991 when he was elected as a member of the parliament in Nepal's first democratic election following the end of the Pachayant system. Mm. And his pr- pragmatic and often hardline approach helped him gain prominence within his party and the broader political landscape. He first became prime minister in October 2015, a tenure marked by his firm stance against India's unofficial blockade of Nepal and the blockade which was imposed in in response to provisions in Nepal's new constitution has caused severe shortages of essential goods in the country, and his government also faced the monumental task of leading recovery efforts after the, that devastating earthquake in April 2015. And in his second term, which began in 2018, he led the government formed. Uh, uh, he led uh, his government. He led the government formed after the historic unification of two major communist parties: his own CPNU. UML and the CPN Maoist Center. And this unification created the Nepal Communist Party, which won a significant majority in the 2017 elections. And he also made significant moves to strengthen Nepal's sovereignty, including revising the country's political map to include disputed territories claimed by India, which further strained relations, of course, between the two countries. And his third term was very brief, marked by internal party conflicts and legal challenges. So in February 2021, he dissolved parliament, citing a lack of cooperation from party members, a move that was later deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Mm. So throughout his political career, he has been known for his nationalist rhetoric and his efforts to balance Nepal's relations with India and China. And he is seen as more favorable to China as he advocates for increased Chinese investment and cooperation and also reducing the country's dependency on India. Mm. Now, in his first term as a prime minister, what challenges will he face? Well, first of all, um, an immediate challenge for Ali is securing a vote of confidence in parliament to continue in office because following his appointment, he must win his vote within a month to solidify his position as prime minister. Although the two parties in his coalition have more than half of the members required for a majority vote, there are still uncertainties about whether all members of Nepali Congress will fully support him. So the vote will be a critical test for his leadership and his ability to maintain coalition unity. And secondly, he must address the economic challenges facing the country. Uh, Due to Nepal's lack of work opportunities, his country heavily relies on remittances from citizens working abroad. So um, his economic dependency creates a precarious situation, especially as the country struggles to recover from the economic impacts of the COVID. So boosting domestic employment, fostering economic growth, and ensuring sustainable development will be crucial tasks for his 
his administration, and also managing natural disasters is another major challenge because Nepal is prone to、uh, earthquakes, landslides, and、uh, monsoon floods, which strain the government's capacity to respond effectively. And、uh, the recent landslide that has、uh, swept two buses into a river highlighted this urgent need for efficient disaster management and relief efforts.、Um, and political instability often hampers the coordinated disaster response. So ensuring a robust and responsive system will be essential. So I believe these are the major challenges that Ali、um, that faces this Ali's government.、Hmm. A lot of work for him. Looking ahead, thank you, Zhao Ying, for provide providing us these details. You're listening to World Today. We'll be right back. <music> I am Dan Wang, Chief Economist of Hang Seng Bank China. The World Today is a real fun program. You will hear interesting people discussing global trend, economic event, what's happening in and outside of China. So, friends around the world, hope you can join us. Welcome back to the show. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. Japan is hosting leaders of Pacific Island nations this week in Tokyo. The tenth Pacific Islands Leaders Meeting, a summit between leaders of Japan and the Pacific Island Forum, is happening Tuesday to Thursday. Kyoto News reported that Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida plans to announce more than 60 billion yen, or about 380 million U.S. dollars, in development aid over the next three years for Pacific Island nations. The summit has taken place every three years since 1997. For more, we're joined by Chen Xi, Assistant to Director of New Zealand Studies Centre with East China Normal University in Shanghai. Thank you, Chen Xi. It's good to have you back on the show. Thank you for having me. Now, Chen Xi.、Uh, first of all, what is this Pacific Islands Leaders Meeting? What is its function and purpose for Japan? Mm, yes. So、uh, the Pacific Island Leaders Meeting was established by Japan in 1997, and it has been organized every three years since then.、Uh, and the meeting itself is actually Japan's outreach to the South Pacific region, hoping to kind of strengthen its influence in Pacific Island nations through this kind of, through this. Uh, conference, and in other words, we can say that、um, this Pacific Island、uh, Leaders Meeting is not only a meeting; it also has a very clear strategic significance, which aims to strengthen Japan's political and even military influence towards Pacific Island nations.、Mm. Uh, talking about these nations, what's the geostrategic importance of a Pacific Island nations these days? Mm, yeah. So you know, especially after the United States announced its Indo-Pacific strategy to、um, exert influence on the、um, South Pacific Island countries through this meeting, is on one hand actually in line with、um, Japan's attempt to increase its、uh, kind of、uh, military capacities, and also on the other hand to increase its importance on the United States strategic、um, chessboard. And we know that、um, after the World War Two, the attention of Western Countries to Pacific Island nations has actually continued to shrink, including that、um, uh, Western countries closed their consulates there and also reduced their aid and, and and so on and also the other means. But the geopolitical importance of the region has、um, in recent years、um, increased significantly following the launch of the、um, US, U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. And in addition,、um, because the South Pacific is adjacent、uh, adjacent to the The、um, Taiwan Island of China on the strategic chessboard of the U.S. and the region is endowed with、uh, strategic functions such as、uh, military bases, logistics and transportation center, etc. But the ultimate goal is to maintain the hegemony of、uh, the United States.、Mm. Well, how much has Japan involved itself in the region? What are Japan's interests in the Pacific Islands?、Mm. 
Yes. So um, Japan once occupied islands in this region during the um, Pacific War and built airfields and uh, arsenal on the islands as bases to further carry out military corpor- operations against like um, Southeast Asia, um, Australia, etc. And historically um, used this region for military purposes. And all of these were at the expense of um, local security and and even local um, people for the Pacific Island nations. And at present, after the announcement of the um, US Indo-Pacific strategy, um, Japan on one hand, like we said just now, like wants to um, break the constitutional limit on its own military capacity. But mm-hmm. on the other hand, it also wants to increase its importance for the US strategy by um, like continuously increasing its influence to the region. Um, Japan has always used like economic and technical assistance as a means. But we could tell from the draft report for this meeting that um, it has a very clear political intention as well. Mm. Well, Kyoto News reported that Tokyo meet, at the Tokyo meeting, uh, Fumio Kishida plans to announce about 380 million US dollars in development aid mm. you know, for this region to counter China's influence and bring the island nations closer to Japan. I mean, what are China's mm. interest in region, and does China intend to exclude anyone else's interest in the region? Yes. So, um, as 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 we can see from uh, the amount of um, Japanese aid planned for this time, the aid is actually only a, only a kind of enticement. And the actual amount of this aid that can be allocated to each island nations is very small. We can see from this that um, Japan's real purpose in convening this meeting is still to exploit the South Pacific island countries rather than to provide very meaningful assistance with economic impactfulness. So Japan actually sees the underdeveloped economic situation of the Pacific Island countries and wants to impose its political intention and the strategic interest on these nations by implementing, we can call it like yen diplomacy. Mm. And from the content of the uh, the, the, the draft released um, before the meeting, there are few real concerns about economic aid and climate change. And these are the real concerns for the uh, Pacific Island nations. And even the Korean Peninsula issue would be included, which has nothing to do with the most concerned challenges faced by these Pacific Island countries. So in other words, we can say that Japan hopes to buy off South Pacific countries with a very small amount of aid. And in addition, the discharge of uh, wastewater last year mm. caused a serious concern among Pacific Island countries. The Pacific Ocean is the environment on which all Pacific Island states depend on for their survival, and the discharge of wastewater brings not only current and present problems, but also future risks as well. In particular, at last year's Pacific Islands Forum, Pacific Islands leaders issued a joint communique expressing the strong concern about the seriousness of the potential threat posed by Japan's release of um, waste of water. And therefore, in this context, uh, both from the meeting hosted by Japan and the draft of this um, kind of uh, joint statement, it can be saying that um, the strategic motive of Japan is to have the South Pacific countries to convey that um, their concerns about nuclear water are actually dispelling. But for China, in conducting cooperation with um, South Pacific Island countries, China has always been committed to fully respecting the sovereignty and independence of the island states, and also fully respect the wishes of island countries, fully respect the cultural tradition of island nations, and also fully respect the strengths of island countries um, through unity. And China's cooperation with the um, South uh, South Pacific countries has no political motive and it does not require the Pacific Island countries to take a position on any kind of the political issues, which is in sharp contrast to Japan's convention of um, this meeting. So the two major challenges facing South Pacific Island countries are economic development and poverty uh, alleviation and climate change, which are the two areas in which China and South Pacific Island countries have achieved the success. China supports um, Pacific Island countries in implementing the Blue Pacific 2050 strategy and stands ready to enhance um, synergy of development strategy with Pacific Island countries to build an even closer community of shared future between China and Pacific Island countries. So the more the Western countries attack the cooperation between China and Pacific nations, the more 
shows that the success of this cooperation is actually real conducive to the future development of these nations. Mm. And China's cooperation with um, Pacific Island nations is not a unilateral export, but a mutually beneficial one. So in this kind of um, process of uh, cooperation, China has also helped improve the local business environment and also upgraded the level of local economic development and infrastructure. Therefore, this cooperation has very like mutual benefits and it, it's also the key to the success of cooperation between China and the Pacific Island countries. But by, uh, but by contrast, to instrumentalize and weaponize the South Pacific country, uh, countries as a tool of great power strategy is the greatest disrespect to the South Pacific Islands themselves. Mm. Economic development, uh, converting climate change, of course, these are among the top concerns for these countries. But uh, thank you, Chen Xi. That was Chen Xi with East China Normal University. And you're listening to World Today. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. Syrians are voting for members of a new parliament in an election on Monday. The vote is a force in Syria since the Syrian civil war broke out in 2011. This year, over 1,500 government-approved candidates are running for the 250-seat People's Assembly. There are about 8,100 polling stations in 15 voting districts in government-held areas. For more, we're joined by Dr. Wang Xin, Associate Professor at Northwest University in Xi'an, China. Thank you, Dr. Wang. It's good to have you back on the show. It's my pleasure again. Now, Dr. Wang, how do you see the current state regarding Syria's development and reconstruction since 2011? I think actually Syria is undergoing a very critical stage. Uh, on the one hand, as we witnessed after uh, after the 2018, uh, 2017, the, especially when the government forces uh, re-controlled a large parts of the Syrian territories, the political stability has been restored and the political order has been constructed and the economic construction process has been started. So actually it has become very, very important for Syrian people to restart, to restart their construction process for, of their own country. And on the other hand, with the encouragement, especially the improvement of the ties between Syria and the regional countries, for mm-hmm. example, not only uh, I mean Syrian con- Syrian uh, bilateral relations with uh, uh, with Iran, with Qatar, but also maybe uh, with Saudi Arabia, with uh, the United Emirates, and as well as of course with uh, uh, with Kuwait and with Bahrain, uh, and many uh, new uh, new things started to, to emerge. That means that the Syrian government has been uh, accepted as a member again by the Arab family. So that is why I think against this backdrop, especially. We know this is the very fourth election of the parliament after 2011, uh, so-called Arab Spring erupted. It would be the very important stage and new beginning for the political sector, for the Syrian people, and also I think it would be the uh, beginning point for the Syrian people to reconstruct their own country. Mm. Now, what are the in this election? What are the minds of the Syrian voters? What are their main issues of concern? I think there will be a lot of uh, the things that they, they, they hope to con- they hope to concern. Uh, for example, they will concern the unity of the government, the unity of their own country, and the political stability of their political structure. Uh, I think the most uh, uh, the concerned things, uh, and not only in Syria but also in, the, in in every part of the world, for the ordinary people, is the economy. Because actually, we know that, uh, of course. A Syrian government, they take measures. They have already taken measures to restore the economy, to to help to improve uh, economic performance. But the problem is still there because actually the Syrian economy con- continues uh, continues to deteriorate it after years of the conflict, for example, also uh, after the years of the United States-led sanctions. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic also influenced the Syrian economy and also the dwindling aid. Uh, due to the due to, uh, from uh, from Iran from Russia, also uh, led to the economic difficulties for the Syrian government as well as for the Syrian uh, population. So, uh, for example, we know that the value of the Syrian national currency against the dollars has been reached a new lows uh, mm-hmm. during the past, especially during the past month, and sparkling the I'm sorry, spark, uh, sparking mm-hmm. the food and the fuel inflation. So that is why uh, I think the the, the economy. 
especially when we are talking about some theory of France, is that what the most concerned thing is the economy, because the economy, uh, economic uh, development, economic uh, increment could come back. And especially for the ordinary people, they hope their living conditions could be largely improved uh, in, in the next uh, few years. Mm. Well, how is the Geneva peace talk on Syria going? I mean, is it making any progress? Uh, of course, there were some kind of the uh, some kind of the new developments, especially some meetings have been organized. I mean, not not some uh, some of the related parties here, representatives, uh, not only Syrian government but also uh, uh, and Syrian opposition parties, but also the the, the representative from, for example, United States, from Russia, and from uh, other powers. I mean, they they may organize some kind of bilateral and multilateral co- uh, uh, meetings with each other, as well as a representative from the United Nations. So uh, everybody is actually making efforts, but uh, the stalemate, unfortunately, is still there, because then still continues. Given the fact that the, the, legitim- the, the legitimacy problem between Syrian government and the opposition parties are still, stand, are still standing, and uh, it's very difficult to coordinate the different stances held by different parties. And also, I think, from the Western uh, countries, uh, they, their motivations and their focus, uh, focus on the Syrian issues has been uh, decreased, especially diverted by the war between Russia and uh, Ukraine, between Israel and uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip. So that is why I think maybe more international attention should be given to, uh, to, the, to the Syrian uh, peace talks in, in Geneva, and the more measures should be taken to encourage the more dialogues be organized and more talks be be held and more uh, improvement that could be encouraged. So that is why I think these would be key uh, for the future peace process, not only for the Syrian people, but also for the whole Middle Eastern region. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Wang Jin. It's always a pleasure to have you on the program. That was Dr. Wang Jin, Associate Professor at Northwest University in Xi'an, China. That's all the time we have for this edition of World Today. A quick recap of the headlines. China's GDP grew 5% in the first half of 2024. Hamas has denied halting indirect ceasefire talks with Israel. And the leader of Nepal's largest communist party has become the prime minister for the fourth time. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching World Today. For more discussions, you can follow us on the X platform at CGTN Radio. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. Thank you for staying with us. Bye for now.